Hi, you guys. Um, this is my first attempt at screencasting one of my lectures. So hopefully you guys find it useful. This one is for chapter 51 on animal behavior. At the beginning of every lecture, I usually start with what's called a list of must knows. So at the end of this chapter, if you must know anything, it is these four uh, basic principles. How behaviors are the result of natural selection. Everything goes back to evolution, right? The ultimate cause of uh, behaviors. We always think that just certain attributes like physical attributes have to do with evolution or are shaped by natural selection, but so are behaviors because they influence survival. How innate and learned behaviors increase survival and reproductive fitness. How organisms use communication to increase their fitness and the role of altruism and inclusive fitness and kin selection. Um, that one is something super quick and I can throw that in at the end. I'm gonna focus mostly on innate and learned behaviors and animal communication. Um, first is just a couple vocab words, etiologies, the study of animal behavior. And then of course, behavior, we're talking about what an animal does and then how it's achieving that or how it does it. There's gonna be genetic factors at work and we'll get a few examples of those and environmental factors as well. Um, they are essential for survival and reproduction. These behaviors, again, have increased the organism's chance of survival. So it teaches those behaviors to its young or even has some innate genetic um, behaviors that it can pass on in order to increase survival for reproduction. And they are subject to natural selection over time. But as far as behavior goes, there's always two questions you should be asking. What's the proximate cause of the behavior? How does this behavior actually occur? What does it look like? Um, a courtship um, ritual or a dance or something weird, or maybe the way a fish orients itself upstream um, and swims against current. That is a proximate cause. Uh, but then the ultimate cause is why does that behavior exist? Why would a fish swim upstream? It seems like it's a lot of energy, right? But you have to imagine that the food for a fish is coming downstream. So it makes sense that a fish would position itself to where its food might swim right towards it. So it um, betters its chance of survival. Um, here's an example of a male stickleback fish. Uh, they are a classic example. I do have a video on it. And I totally forgot to tell you guys about um, my YouTube channel. Uh, it's not really a channel, it's like a playlist. And I have a great video on the male stickleback fish and Tinnenbergen's famous um, experiment on fixed action patterns. So um, I'll try to remember to show those to you at some point. A uh, male stickleback fish will attack another fish. If it invades its territory, it attacks, right? And that's the proximate cause. There's this red belly on the male stickleback. And as soon as the male sees that red belly, it attacks. Now, then you have to ask yourself, well, what is the ultimate cause of this aggressive territorial behavior? It's um, access to females, right? Nesting. So there's a female nearby. Um, the male wants to make sure that if he had this female lay his eggs, um, that they are protected and they remain his so that his genes are the ones that survive. Innate behaviors are fixed. So they are not learned behaviors. Uh, the example of this is called a fixed action pattern. This is something that you are, um, the organism is born with. It automatically does these things. It doesn't have to learn them to know to do them. They're often triggered by what's called a sign stimulus. This example in the PowerPoint is a goose laying eggs. If they see an egg roll away, the first thing they have to do is roll the egg gently back. What's interesting about a goose is like you could throw a rock near it. And if it looks like the rock is rolling, it will go over there and start rolling the rock back towards it. It's a fixed action pattern. The sign stimulus is the rolling behavior of that round object. It's something that is innate. It didn't have to learn how to take care of its eggs. It's automatic. Um, this is again, that example. Oh, good. I, I put the link in here. So this lecture, by the way, is on my website. It is under lecture materials, and this is PowerPoint uh, for chapter 51. And there is a link in there that I hope still works. 
and takes you guys to that um, classic experiment. It's fun to watch the fish attack like a fake looking fish. Basically, they stuck these things on a stick into the water, one that looks just like a fish, but because it doesn't have the red belly, it didn't get attacked. But then all the ones that um, have the red belly were attacked, even if they weren't shaped like a fish. So they figured out that what the sign stimulus was for this example or this um, instance is the red belly, not the fact that it's just another fish. Um, now, kinesis and taxis, this is the, the words that you guys are going to define in the background paragraph on your roly-poly lab or your mealworm lab. Um, kinesis is just a random movement. So the fact that a roly-poly will move randomly very, very fast when it's in an environment that it doesn't like, that's just going to increase its chance of getting to an environment that it does like. Okay, so think about, again, the ultimate cause. Why would an organism move really fast in an environment that it doesn't like? Because its chances of getting to an environment it does like go up if it moves quickly. Now, it doesn't know to move towards shade. A roly-poly can't seek out shade. It just happens to run into shade because it moves so fast in the heat or in the light. As soon as it gets to shade, it's going to slow down because it's in an environment that it likes. Okay, so kinesis is a random movement. It's not in any particular direction, but it's a change in activity. It's gonna have a different rate of activity based on its environment. Whereas taxis, oh, some of my words got cut off there. A taxis is an automatic movement in a particular direction. It's oriented movement, like the fish um, pointing its, itself upstream. It knows its food is coming from that direction, so it's to its advantage to point itself in that direction. That is um, a taxis. There's also geotaxis. There's um, can, uh, there's a couple of others under there. Um, but basically, um, any type of um, orientation in the direction in which the organism benefits. Then we have migration. These are not really kinesis or taxis. They are long distance changes in location. It's a little different. These other ones are more um, small scale. Uh, a lot of organisms use environmental cues like the sun to know when a season is going to end, the day length, and then they go to a different environment where the chances of survival are higher. Circadian rhythms. Again, I got another little video clip there for you to watch on clock genes. It's an interview with a scientist who um, discovered or studied that we do have a gene that codes for our sleep cycles. So if you are a morning person, that's probably coded for in your DNA. Um, you have a natural rhythm in how our body knows when um, to fall asleep and when to wake up. And it is um, a gene. There's also hormones. That's why um, if anybody takes melatonin, that um, can help too. So your body knows to release this hormone in the twilight hours, um, and that is going to help um, you get environmental cues to fall asleep. So you can take melatonin. It's fairly healthy um, as long as you don't abuse it, like take too much. I don't know why you would want to sleep all the time, but you take it to help you sleep. Um, and it's a, it's a natural uh, hormone that your body makes naturally. So um, you could take it safely as long as it's in a, a normal amount. Um, and then just exposing your, your body to twilight light. And that's why they say technology is bad at, at night, like looking at your cell phone is bad. They even have a new setting on your cell phone where you can turn off the daylight, the blue backlight on there. And it's like nighttime mode and it projects like a different color light so that your brain doesn't think it's morning light. Because most of um, these screens, these um, LCD screens, use like a blue toned light and that um, cues your brain into morning. So it's hard for you to power down if you're looking at screens at any time or reading a book. Um, now a signal. So we've been talking about signals already, but the basis or the basic definition of a signal is any stimulus that causes a change in behavior. And these are ways that animals communicate with one another. My favorite one, and again, I really wish we were in class because um, I love showing this one, 
um, is the, the waggle dance um, that, that bees do. It is a visual signal uh, and it's a form of animal communication. There's chemical signals like pheromones um, that animals use. Everyone's heard of like um, an ant trail, right? Like how one ant knows how to get to where the food was because other members of its species have left chemical signals for it to follow. We can't smell them, but ants can, they know. A queen bee emits a signal for her hive, so they know where she's at. Um, tactiles, touch, um, there's a lot of weird behaviors. And um, as an animal behaviorist, you're always looking at it like, why would the fly do that? Why does he keep coming over to the female and tapping her on the side and then running away? Um, it's a very odd thing. But it's a it's a form of communication saying I want to mate. Um, auditory signals, screeching or bird songs. Um, again, where one member of the species recognizes another, usually to find mates. Um, the waggle dance. Oh, good. I'm glad I have the video here. I hope all my links work because this one is so entertaining. Uh, basically, the bee waggles its butt, like it waggles its booty in one direction. And you think like, oh, it's simple. It waggles its butt in the direction of food, but it doesn't. It actually has to do with the angle to the sun that the plant is. It's doing geometry and the whole hive and all the other bees like know what angle they're doing it at and they can orient themselves um, from the sun that way. So it's crazy cool. Um, learned behaviors. So these are, there's a few of them. Imprinting is a learned behavior that has a genetic component, which is kind of weird. Um, problem solving behaviors, like the higher order mammals can do those, like um, crows and chimpanzees and dolphins. Um, spatial behavior, I'll try to go through some of these um, quick examples. Um, habituation basically just means that early on, the more you're exposed to, you kind of just learn how to get stuff done. So it's like, um, yeah, I'm trying to think, it's like a habit, like, um, I don't know, brushing your teeth. Um, you, at the beginning as a kid, you do it repetitively, repetitively, um, you know how to do the motion to clean your teeth, and then you just memorize it and it becomes a set of motions you do automatically without having to be taught. That's just the simplest form of learning. It's repeat, repeat, repeat. Imprinting, it's got a weird genetic component that's like innate. So like a goose, these geese are born with these genes that tell it to look for a mom because it's gonna learn how to fly or it's gonna learn how to go you know, south for the winter. So you have to make sure that the organism is uh, basically in touch with its parent or something that's gonna teach it that behavior in order to make sure it imprints correctly. Um, this is a famous case of Conrad Lawrence. He's a, an animal behaviorist. He studied imprinting. And basically when the geese were born, they saw him first. And so they just assumed, uh, you must be my mother. And they started following him around. Unfortunately, when it comes time for them to migrate, it's really important that they follow um, their mom goose to where they're supposed to go. So um, in order to make sure that they get to where they need to be, he built like an airplane that looks like a goose. And he flew uh, on the path of migration and the little baby geese followed him. Um, this is in a movie, Disney made a movie about it. It's called Fly Away Home. And they basically took um, a little girl and told the story um, through, through her eyes, but it is kind of a famous um, case on imprinting. Um, so this is, again, just from your textbook, these different behaviors. Always ask yourself, always go back to proximate cause and ultimate cause. Proximate cause is always just describing the behavior. The ultimate cause is always about how um, they, how it relates to evolution or natural selection. That is the ultimate cause. So following your mom is going to give you a better chance to survive than if you didn't. So hence the imprinting behavior. Um, and this is again important. <laughs> um, here's a, a picture of a, somebody leading some whooping cranes uh, on their migration path because they obviously didn't imprint on their mom. It's really important for captive breeding programs if you guys are ever going to work in zoos or with animals for a living 
it's very important that you know a lot about the critical period for that organism to make sure that it is uh, properly imprinted uh, so that it can be released out to the wild. If it doesn't imprint um, correctly, it will never be able to be released because it doesn't have those survival mechanisms. Cognitive mapping or spatial maps. Um, they did a few experiments with wasps, basically organisms using landmarks. Uh, in this case, the wasp built its nest in a bunch of um, pine trees. They, they use pine cones here to, to show you that. And then if they move the pine trees and, and use these landmarks, the wasp will go to where the pine trees are, not to where its nest is. So it doesn't actually know where its nest is. It just knows where the landmarks are. So this is why um, if you guys destroy a wasp nest at your house, they come back every year. You're going to be destroying that nest all the time until you change the landmarks. If you change something really um, drastic in the yard and change the things that are around where the wasp is nesting, then maybe you can get rid of it because they won't be able to find their, their spot. Um, associative learning. Um, this is coming from um, like B.F. Skinner. You know, we have like these, these famous um, psychology scientists that use classical conditioning, operant conditioning, associative learning. Um, basically, this bird ate a monarch. It made him violently ill. That's him. I oh, can't point. That's him puking right there. Um, and so now he's like, every time I see one of those, you know, spicy orange butterflies, I'm not going to eat it. It made me so sick last time. So that helps the monarch because now every butterfly that looks like um, orange and black, blue jays are going to avoid because they have a bad association with it. Then you have classical conditioning. This is just some arbitrary stimulus associated with a particular outcome. Famous um, instance of classical conditioning um, is Pavlov's dog, right? He associated the ringing of a bell, which survival wise means absolutely nothing um, with food. So as soon as the bell would ring, there would be food. So now food is needed for survival. So um, they associated the bell ringing with food enough times to where the dog would hear a bell immediately assume food was nearby and start salivating in anticipation of that food. Does the bell actually mean anything about food for survival purposes? No, but the um, animals have the ability to associate um, an arbitrary stimulus with something for survival. And then there's operant conditioning. And here's B.F. Skinner's stuff. Um, trial and error, um, reward and punishment. This picture is actually, um, this one is sad. There's this one of the coyote with the porcupine quills in its face. And that's sad because it's like well, punishment, right? Don't ever go after one of those crazy looking animals because it hurts. It's trial and error. This picture on the left is actually kind of um, morbid, but they use rats um, and mice in scientific experiments all the time. That grate that he's sitting on, the silver grate, is electrified. So if the mouse does a series of movements, like pedal and um, then and then does like a little turn and then hits it again, if he does that correctly, a food pellet will be released. Um, and then it pushes on the lever and it gets food. If it does something wrong, then it will receive an electric shock. This is called a Skinner box. And this is how B.F. Skinner did his work on operant conditioning. The behaviors that received an electric shock were repeated less often, if at all, and the behaviors that received food increased in frequency. Then we have the cool stuff. This is um, the higher order mammals and really smart birds. Um, cognition, this is awareness, problem solving ability, reasoning, um, and it's very, very cool to watch animals who have high levels of cognition do their thing. So cool that I put a whole bunch of videos of it on here um, at the end because I thought that you guys would like to see some really cool examples. There is um, a really neat example of crows um, cracking nuts on the city street. And then there is another really good one of chimpanzees um, doing cooperative learning in order to get food. Um, and then there's social learning. This picture, it's hard to see, but there's a reason why these vervet monkeys are sounding the alarm and it's right here. See my moving mouse? That is a giant snake um, on its way to hopefully nab a monkey. 
or a vervet monkey baby. So um, usually one will warn all the others to get away. Now, if it was all about survival, then why warn the others, right? Why not just run away? Um, and that's where kin selection comes in. So that's where I'm gonna try and end. Oh, by the way, the video that I want you guys to watch, the really cool one is the Nutcracking Crow and the Chimpanzee um, Problem Solving by Cooperation. That one is also really great. So the first one and the last one. If you have any time to watch the other ones, they're cool too. Um, okay, foraging. This one is uh, just how an organism obtains food. So obviously the ultimate cause is survival. Food is survival. So think about all the behaviors that organisms have to help them gain access to food. This one is a very interesting case um, with graphs. It's got really neat um, graphs to it. So this first graph has to do with um, fruit flies and the distance, I guess, that they are willing to um, fly or, or the path that they take in order to get food. When the population density is very low and there's a lot of open space, the three different lineages of fruit flies, they don't travel very far. They don't travel very far to get food. They don't have to because they travel a little bit and food is available because there's not a lot of other flies. The lineages that come from high population density fruit fly populations um, tend to fly a lot longer in order to find food. And this is because they had to compete for space. And so they usually had to go further in order to get food. So being able to reason that using this graph um, is a very good skill. So ask yourself when you guys see graphs like this in the textbook or even in lectures, what exactly can I tell from looking at this graph? An even more difficult graph is this one. This one is um, got two white axes. And so it makes it very complicated looking. Um, and if we were in class, I would give you guys this graph and have you talk about it with each other and try to figure out what information can you get from looking at this graph. First thing I would want you to notice is um, what the two different color bars represent. So there's a key provided. The orange bar tells you how many times the bird had to drop the um, nut in order to get it to crack open. And then the green bar is how high up the bird had to fly in order to get it to drop hard enough on the ground to crack it. So there's two strategies there, dropping it a whole bunch of times until it finally cracks or flying up really, really high and getting gravity to do the work for you. So now we look at those two factors and we say, oh, when, the, when they only flew up two meters high, look at how many times they had to drop it. They had to drop that, that seed like 55 times in order to, um, to drop that thing. Um, so a lot of birds that flew only two meters um, had to drop it lots of times. Of the birds that flew really, really high, went up 15 meters. They had to drop it quite a bit too, surprisingly, um, but not half as much as this orange one over here. Um, this preferred height is the one that uh, basically allows a crow to expend less energy, but also, um, so not fly as high, but also not have to drop it so many times. So this is a cost benefit analysis of animal behavior. The preferred drop height of crows is 5.23 meters because is, is it is the shortest distance it has to fly up to get the least number of average drops. Now, again, you could look over here and say, yeah, but look, a lot less drops if you would just fly higher, but that would take more energy. So that's why it doesn't do that. Because think about what it's eating for. It's eating for energy. Um, sexual selection, a lot of weird behaviors in the animal kingdom are there because it helps it get a mate. So um, anytime you see a weird behavior, you go, why the heck would an animal even do that? It probably has something to do um, with, with mating. Um, and so there's a couple different strategies here for mating. And again, whatever works evolutionarily for that organism is the one you're going to see because natural selection has shaped these behaviors and they work for survival for that organism. That's why they do it. You don't need to know the specifics. You don't need to know the difference between polyandry and um, polygamous. 
but this is a good chart that summarizes them. What we mean by partners is how many partners in a breeding season. So when it says monogamous, it's not like a partner for life. Like penguins are monogamous because in their breeding season, they find one mate and one mate only, and they put all their energy into caring for that one egg and that one mate. But then next breeding season, they will go find another one. Um, here's just a few examples from your textbook so that you can associate an organism with its, its way of um, mating. Whenever um, sexual selection is at work, you're gonna see some, again, really weird structures that accompany those behaviors. So why a peacock has those fancy feathers? You look at it and you go, well, that can't help it with survival. It looks like a giant flashy, you know, uh, disco ball that's walking around on legs. They couldn't fly with those big giant feathers. So, so easy for a predator to find and catch. Why would it have those big feathers? It's probably to get a mate. So a lot of weird showy things. Um, and then sometimes violent behaviors too have to do with um, competition. So you'll see behaviors even among the same species. You would think, why can't we all get along? Like I'm a polar bear, you're a polar bear. We want what's best for all polar bears. No, they want what's best for their genes. So if it comes to access to mates or food, um, you're going to get um, an agonistic behaviors. Um, voles, those are two voles um, doing behaviors uh, that males and females do. They're trying to pass on their genes. Um, and these types of behaviors are under strong genetic control, meaning that either the vole will be aggressive because it makes a certain hormone um, that a gene that it has makes it make, or it won't be aggressive at all. It'll end up being very um, caring and um, pair bond uh, with just one mate if it has a certain level of vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. So kind of a weird, a weird thing where this, this genetic component of behavior has been studied. Um, that's just more examples of the promiscuous mole versus um, the monogamous mole. And then the very end here is altruism. So again, it's not like, like those monkeys, right? Saying, hey, everybody run, there's a giant snake coming our way. They're gonna warn everybody else because that is selfless. Um, and it's not just about individual fitness. For a species, you wanna increase the chances that some of you will be able to survive. This is how bees work. You have a few of them that work really hard to keep the rest of the hive alive. Do they ever mate? No, they never pass on their genes. All they do is keep everybody alive so that the bees that do mate with the queen get all their needs met. And that keeps their, um, their shared species, so they do share a genetic component, keeps it alive. So um, there's not always, it's not always about the individual. In some societies, um, and I would say even in human societies, it's about the survival of all and why we call it inclusive fitness. So it's not just passing on our genes, but any other people that share our genes. You ever wonder why we um, hold family so high up, you know, like, oh, you can't do that because it's family, you know, like you have to forgive them. They're family. Blood is thicker than water. All those sayings that comes from our roots in this altruistic social behavior where it's not only important for our genes to survive, but we want um, our genes, even if they are in others, we want them um, to get onto the next generation. So inclusive fitness takes that into account. Kin selection is just the type of natural selection that increases um, the inclusive fitness. It is a way um, to make sure that your relatives um, are successful uh, in passing on the family genes. Um, then there's a quick quote that I end this one with, which is, what does this quote mean? I won't lay down my life for one brother, but I would lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. So think about that one. It's a bit of a genetics um, quote, a bit of a genetics joke, and it has a lot to do with altruism. If you have questions about that quote or what he means by that, 
we can talk. I want you to think about that. Um, and then I ask a review question at the end, and these are for you. If you feel comfortable and confident being able to do this, then go back to the must knows and double check your understanding of them. If you still got lost reading the chapter and listening to, to this lecture, feel free to go back and watch any one part of it again. You also have the internet, so please um, look up anything that's still confusing for you. I'm going to sign off. You guys have a wonderful night, and I'll see you tomorrow.